I had a flat tire yesterday. Actually, I didn't get it. My wife got a flat tire. It's actually, I've never had a flat tire in my entire life. Knock on wood. I'm 42 years old. Never had a flat tire. Same with my wife. I won't say how old she is, but that was the first flat tire that she has ever had. Oh, check out this picture that my brother sent me. Look at this. This is hilarious. Uh, he found this listing somewhere on eBay. This person who ever took this picture clearly is sick of getting messages from eBay buyers asking for the measurements of something. I bet they still get messages from eBay buyers asking for the measurements of something with a picture like that. Anyway, I wanted to share that picture with y'all. Thought it was hilarious. What else was going on this week on eBay? Did you happen to notice that for a few days eBay's messaging system reverted to some super old one? And I thought I did something wrong. I thought I changed the setting somewhere, but it turns out it was affecting everyone else as well. So fortunately they fixed it though. Did that happen to y'all? Did y'all notice that? I also saw that Facebook is doubling their fees for selling on their platform from 5% to 10%, which is kind of a big jump. Uh, 5% was pretty low compared to other marketplaces like eBay, but I don't know about y'all, but I just don't ship stuff on Facebook. It's like the wild west. I feel like there's no seller protection at all. And so hopefully with this increased fees, they're going to actually do things like provide seller protection and seller support, but it's like nobody to get a hold of there. If something goes wrong, buyers can basically do whatever they want. Figured I would answer a few reader questions as well today. Justin, how long are you holding on to dead inventory? I picked up a lot of eight of these larger items that I have come to realize were probably a bad purchase. That being said, they only set me back 15 bucks each, so not overly terrible, but they've been a horrible in performance. Do you do a garage sale for your dead inventory or do you have another method? Redonate. That's a good question. I don't do a whole lot of garage sales. It's I just don't want to sit around on a Saturday when there's a bunch of other garage sales happening that I could be sourcing at. I don't think that's a good use of my time specifically because I can go out and buy, you know, 500 to a thousand dollars worth of inventory on a garage sale Saturday, or I could stay at home and make a couple hundred bucks selling old inventory. So it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense for me to do that. So I don't do garage sales very often. I usually just redonate that stuff. And for that stuff that you redonate, you can write that cost off on your taxes. And so keep track of that stuff. I also just have a pretty big space for my inventory. And so that means I don't really have to get rid of older, slow moving inventory. Some people are working out of smaller spaces and they're more inclined to want to get rid of that stuff, but I've got enough space. So it's not something I do that regularly. I'm happy to let something sit for a year before it sells. All right, let's jump into the top 10 sales of the week. I am going to answer more viewer questions mixed throughout those top 10 sales. So stick around to see some more question and answers. Let's take a look at my numbers for the week though. Looks like I had a total of 540% ROI for the last seven days and a net profit margin of 50 1%, a gross income of $1,061 and a net income of $555. So things are still very slow for me. It's not so much just that my sales are slow, but also sourcing has been really, really slow for me. And it goes in ebbs and flows. And I try not to get discouraged when I go through slow periods of sourcing, but there's just times when there's not inventory out there and it's difficult to find. And so if you're experiencing the same sort of ebbs and flows of, of sourcing and finding it difficult to find new inventory, like don't let that discourage you. That time will pass. You will find better inventory if you stick with it and continue going. And so, in fact, the first half of this last week was really bad for me. I was finding like literally nothing at thrift stores. It was super crazy. But the latter half of the week did start to pick up. I started to find some interesting things and I started to make some more sales. But yeah, $555 in net income for the week is low. I usually typically do about double that. So sales are slow on eBay right now. You can see there that Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, very slow for me. And then, you know, Friday, Saturday, I had a very good weekend. So things picked up. Looks like I had 30 three new listings over the last seven days and 29 sales. So again, 33 is a low number. I usually do about double that. I'm just not finding good inventory and I don't have a good backlog of existing inventory that needs to be listed. Interestingly though, average time to sell is one month. Typically my average time to sell in any given week is about three months. And so this means I'm selling newer inventory and my older inventory is not selling or was not in this past week. I spent a total of $170 on inventory over the past seven days. What else is interesting? Looks like this is interesting too. It looks like a majority of my inventory that I've listed over the last seven days has been pretty cheap. So some of it, you know, about a quarter of it's been under $20 and the rest of it's been between $20 and $50. And so not a whole lot of valuable inventory that I'm finding and listing over the past week. Coming in at number 10 is this 2008 Chevrolet Tahoe right passenger front window switch. And so if you all have watched the channel, you see these window switches pop up quite a bit because I bought a couple big boxes full of them and they are a pain in the butt to list. I have to clean them. I have to research them, but they usually sell for pretty good money. This one was no different. $34.99 looks like I got a net return of $20.88 for the 10th best flip of the week. These things are just 
kind of in the background. Whenever I'm low on inventory, I dig into that box and I list these things and they're slow sellers. This one took 14 days. I guess that's not horrible, but typically they're slow sellers. Coming in at number nine is this Fire Department EMT sweatshirt. So this is a brand. What is this brand? I've already forgotten. I just noticed while making this video right now that I did not even put the brand of the sweatshirt in the title. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking when I was making this listing. The brand is called Game. This one really surprised me. Typically things that are made in US and that are clearly vintage are going to be pretty good bets to make. I found this at a thrift store, St. Vincent de Paul for $7. And the I, I looked it up and the game brand sold pretty well. It's just, I guess it's clothing that fire fighters wear. I don't think they wear them under their suits. Maybe they do. I have no idea. But the sell-through rate on this was surprisingly good. And it only took 10 days to sell, but it's just hilarious that I completely forgot to include the brand name in the title. I'm sure I had in the metadata, but still. My advice to you is to put the brand name in the title. Don't take after me here. I'm not sure what I was thinking. My net return on this one, though, was $22.00. 29 cents for the ninth best flip of the week. We have another question here from uh, Opera Annie, Opera, Oprah. When you have an item that took six months to sell, do you, do you end and relist it a couple times during that six months? Typically, yeah. So if I have an item that hasn't sold for six months or so, typically I'm ending and relisting that item to sort of freshen it up in the in the eBay algorithm. This is a pretty debatable topic. Some people think ending and relisting does nothing. Other people think it does a whole lot. I'm of the camp that ending and relisting does help. It's not a silver bullet. It's not going to make something sell that has no demand. And so a good time to end and relist is if you're it's a very saturated item. So if there's tons of supply, it's kind of hard to stick out, right? And so ending and relisting sort of boosts that listing's prominence up in search. eBay's search does give prominence to newer listings as a factor when it determines to how to rank listings in search. And so you'll see this sometimes when you search for something, you'll see a badge that says like new listing. If your item has no demand, like no amount of ending and relisting is going to change that and it will sit for six months and never sell. But if your item has like 500 uh, competitors out there, I do find it's helpful to end and relist just to remain competitive with those competitors out there. All right, coming in at number seven is this Patricia Nash floral crossbody leather phone wallet handbag. Uh, I know nothing about this. My wife bought it. Looks like we got it as Savers for $5.16 13 days ago. Uh, it sold for $38.48 for the seventh best flip of the week. Our net return on it was $22.50. Cost to ship was $5.15. ROI is a 402% on that one. So this is a good one that illustrates if you, know, if you have a partner who's interested in doing reselling as well, it's not only a good way to spend time together, but it it vastly increases what your potential is when it comes to sourcing new inventory. My wife knows a, about a lot of categories that I know nothing about. I never would have picked this up. I have no idea who Patricia Nash is or whether her crossbody leather phone wallet handbags are desirable or not. And I just would never know and I would never pick it up. And I'm going to go to other things that I already know has value. But Having two people together doing this is an excellent way to basically double what your potential is for sourcing new inventory. So if you have a partner out there, see if you can convince them to go out with you sourcing and you probably will come back with more things than you would if you were just going alone. That was actually number eight. Uh, I said it was seven. This one's actually number seven. It's a Peter Millar quarter zip pullover. Peter Millar is a really great golf clothing brand. In fact, I was at Savers here. I got it for $8, sold it for $42.98. I actually found five of these right in a row. Must have been somebody donating their entire collection. I ended up only buying two of them though because three of them had little patches on the side that were for very specific golf clubs. Those probably would have sold also, but for less money and way slower. So oftentimes you'll see this at thrift stores. You'll find a Patagonia jacket and be all excited and then notice that it says has some brand on it like Purina or something like and like oh man that sucks some of those still do sell in fact I just bought a Google branded Scotty vest shirt that sold within a day and so some of the big brands are going to do well but often they're just it's going to reduce the value instead of increase the value and increase the time to sell but anyway this one sold for $42.98 the net return was $24.33 a 304% ROI Peter Millar great brand to look out for Seventh best flip of the week. Let's take a look at some other viewer questions before we move on here. Hey, Justin, love your content, and you are refreshingly different from many of the other reselling YouTube gurus. Thank you. Appreciate that. Have a question for a long time. You mentioned an average three to four minutes listing time, which I agree with. It takes about a minute to find a similar listing, use the sell one like this option, the minute or two to take the photos. But as anyone who's bought anything in a thrift store knows before listing details, you've got to remove labels and price tags, check battery power, adapter power, remove stains, markings, verify functionality. So once all of that is done, it does take only three to four minutes to list. But what's your average per item time to pull something out of a thrift store bag, test it, clean it before photography and listing? So that's a really great question. And I think this person's referencing one of my videos 
sellers how to list nearly anything on eBay in four minutes or less. And they're right. In that video, I don't talk about any like prep work that has to go into that. The reason I didn't bring that up because it's completely dependent on what you buy. And that's my dog. I swear I can never make it through a video without my dogs barking. It's extremely annoying, but it seems like y'all don't really care. Y'all like dogs. Y'all have dogs, so let them bark, I guess, right? Anyway, how to list anything in four minutes or less. I don't account for that sort of prep time because that is a pretty subjective thing. It totally depends on what you buy. If you buy things like stained clothing, yeah, that time is going to increase a lot. And one of the factors that I consider when trying to decide whether to buy something to resell or not is how much time is it going to take to get ready to list it. And so I love finding things things that are new in package that have a barcode, that means it's going to be easy for me to just list it within probably two minutes, not even four minutes, because I can scan a barcode, find the listing, I don't have to do any prep and clean work, and it's all ready to go. But most things do require some prep work and some cleaning. So, you know, removing stickers can be a pain in the butt. I have a lot of different tools to use to remove stickers and make that an easy process. You know, if you're buying clothes or shoes, often those things are going to take time to clean. But again, I, I often just won't buy those types of things. If Clothing has significant stains on it, unless it's super valuable, I just pass on it. I let someone else take care of it who doesn't mind doing that type of work. Same goes for shoes. Like I like buying shoes, but if it requires, there's like caked in mud and it requires a lot of cleaning, I'm just not gonna do that work. I'm not gonna, I don't wanna spend my time doing that type of thing. And so I will only buy shoes if the amount of cleaning is, is minimal. Somebody asked in one of my other videos, like what, what sort of margin do you look for when you're buying? Like margin's only one factor that I consider when trying to determine whether to buy something or not. And other factors like, is it gonna be a pain in the butt to ship? Is it gonna take a bunch of time to clean and test and prep and all that stuff? Like if the answer to that is yes, it's gonna take a bunch of time, like it, my likelihood of buying it to resell goes down unless the value of it goes up. And so there's no one fast hard rule for any of that stuff and I kind of wing it and, and use all those factors to determine whether or not to buy it. Coming in at number six is this Avita Stress Fix Body Cream Stress Relieving I don't even know. What is this? This is lotion of some sort, cream you put on your body to relieve stress. I have no idea. Not a category I'm that familiar with, but I did know the Avita brand. I know that is a high dollar brand. I saw it at Savers. I paid $3. No, sorry. I saw it at Salvation Army. I paid $3. It sold in about a month for $41.98. The net return was $26.42 for an 881% ROI. I'm not sure where I heard about the Avita brand. I've sold it before but it's very good. So if you see Avita stuff, pick it up. Uh, you also might want to check and see if there's an expiration date on this stuff. I don't think this one had an expiration date. So fingers crossed that this person opens it up and it's not powder um, when it should be some sort of cream. That was the sixth best flip of the week. Coming in at number five is this American Girl Felicity doll. So I just bought this one very recently. It only took a day to sell for $41.98. I got it in an estate sale. It actually was not an estate sale, or at least not a typical estate sale. This was in a big warehouse. I think it was a shipping company like um, a moving company's warehouse. And I think that they were selling people stuff that they'd never paid for after moving it halfway across the country because everything had those little orange stickers on it for inventory. And so it was a really interesting and unique place to source inventory from. I'd never done something like that. This was just this past weekend. And I found some really good stuff. You'll see more of it here on the top 10 list. But anyway, American Girl is obviously a very good brand. This one was from 2008, had no clothes on it. By the way, when doing the research for listing this, I saw some people would put nude instead of no clothes, which I thought was... I don't know, that seems sort of creepy. Does that seem creepy to y'all? But this was our fifth best flip of the week, and the net return was $26.53, 884% ROI on that one. All right, let's jump to another question here. Uh, here from SebG9315, what do you do to keep your reselling business running while on vacation? How would you go about staying consistent listing if you cannot easily access what is needed to do so? So good question. If you go on vacation, can you keep your business running? There is a couple things that you can do. So eBay does offer a vacation mode. You can put that on and that can be configured to either allow sales to happen while you're away or to completely shut down your store and not allow any sales at all. And so personally, when I go on vacation, I put vacation mode on and I do not allow sales while I'm gone. It's super cool to get sales while you're on vacation, but I have found that buyers don't read very often, which surprise, surprise. eBay puts a banner at the top of your listing that says this seller is away on vacation. It won't return and therefore shipping will be delayed, yada, yada, yada. But most people don't notice that. They buy it anyway. And then two days after they buy it, they see it's not shipped and you're sitting on a beach somewhere and they're sending you messages complaining and you have to stop and be like, oh, well, I'm on vacation. I'm going to, you know, just it's annoying. So I just turn sales off completely. If you do keep sales on and want to do that, you totally can and it's totally fine. You can also schedule listings to go live. And so you could do a bunch of prep work before you leave, have a bunch of drafts saved up and then schedule those drafts to go live while you're 
away on vacation just to sort of keep that consistent listing going while you're gone. I don't do any of that, but you can do that. And then when you get back from vacation, you know, recovering from vacation mode is a thing. You're not immediately going to make sales right away. So you flip vacation mode back on. I tend to do a lot of ending and relisting, just sort of get those listings refreshing back up in the eBay algorithm. And within a few days, things usually return back to normal. So that's how I handle it. Coming in at number four is this excellent garage sale find, My Little Pony. This is classic stuff you're going to find at a garage sale. This was straight from the 80s, maybe 90s, probably the 80s though. There's a whole collection of My Little Pony stuff. My wife found it. She got super excited. We bought it for 10 bucks. In three days, it sold for $54.98. That's $39.99 plus $15 in shipping. The net return for the fifth best flip was $27.65. Five cents. Only a 277% ROI. That's just because our cost of goods was a little bit higher, but worth it for something like this, for this piece of nostalgia here. I love finding old 80s toys like this. And in fact, the areas where we go garage sailing here in St. Louis are in areas where there are older people like my own parents' age. And so I expect to see lots of toys that are from my era, and I just don't. And it's kind of surprising. So when I do see these, it's pretty exciting. Coming in at number three is this Tim Holtz Sizzix Christmas die cast thing. I bought a lot of Sizzix stuff over the years and I'll be honest, like I'm still not exactly sure what it is. I'm pretty sure it's like scrapbook related. I know y'all in the comments are going to tell me exactly what it is, but they can go for some really good money. And I've learned a little bit more about them after finding them at estate sales and garage sales. And this one's from Tim Holtz, I think as a designer, you know, again, I'm not exactly sure how these machines work, but I take it to be some sort of like cutter. So like this is stamping down and cutting paper into particular shapes. This is crazy how valuable some of these can be. This this one went for $51.98. The net return was $36.48, over an 1,800% ROI because we only paid $2 for it at a garage sale. So a lot of the Sizzix stuff I think is not worth it. Um, we pass on a lot of it, but some of it can be really good. So look it up when you see it. All right, let's answer another question here. Uh, it looks like Code War Poet asked, I know this is in your AMA video or request for questions, but I wanted to see if you had thoughts on the topic. What strategies or overall thought process do you use when trying to determine the price of a one-of-a-kind item not listed? anywhere on eBay. So a really good question. I've got a whole video called the eBay pricing problem that talks about this in detail, but I'll answer your question just really quick. Often when you can't find active or sold comps on eBay for some rare and unique item, it makes it more difficult to figure out what to price it. And so there's a couple options. One, uh, instead of using eBay search, you can use Terapeak, which is an eBay product as well. Uh, eBay standard search goes back 90 days. And so sometimes if something hasn't sold in the last 90 days, it's going to be difficult to find a, an accurate comp for it. So using Terapeak, I think it goes back two years, maybe they change it to three, I'm not sure, but at least two years. Sometimes a more rare or unique item hasn't sold in 90 days, but it has sold in the last two years and shows up on Terrapig. So that's step number one. Step number two is something like WorthPoint. Uh, WorthPoint is a completely separate website. It's not affiliated with eBay in any sort of way, but they do, they have historical pricing. Uh, I think it's from eBay only going back like I don't know, forever, at least like a decade, maybe not, maybe longer. But WorthPoint is expensive. I think it's like $35 a month or something. It's just super crazy. I don't use a WorthPoint account, uh, mostly because I don't sell the types of things that are rare and unique like that, where I need to use WorthPoint very frequently. So if I, if you sell things like antiques or rare collectibles or things like that, WorthPoint, you know, their fee may be just like chump change and maybe a no brainer to pay them for that access. But for me, I just don't use it enough. So it doesn't justify the cost. So that would be a third step is to check there. Fourth step, really, if I can't find any sort of comps or I'm having really a really difficult time assessing the value of something, another option besides worth point would be just searching Google, like see if something shows up somewhere on some other marketplace or some other website. It starts to get a little bit dicey when you do that because you just can't guarantee what, you know, if these people are actually getting the, these prices that they're advertising on their own personal side or anything like that. So you can't always trust it, but it's worth a shot to just check Google as well. Finally, this is a good option to use an auction. So I have another video on when to use buy it now versus when to use auctions and 99.9% .9 of the time, you always want to use buy it now unless uh, some conditions are met. And one of those conditions are is like, I can't find a, an accurate uh, market value for something. That's a good reason to use uh, an auction instead of a buy it now. It's not the only reason. Just because you can't find a, uh, an accurate market value doesn't mean you automatically should do an auction. You also want to make sure that this item has a lot of demand uh, or you want to make sure that it has very little supply. And so those are all three good factors to consider when using an auction. But I actually just recently used an auction. I'd say I used 
use an auction maybe twice a year. That's how rare it is. But I just found this glove here. Check out this glove. I found this in an estate sale. It's a 1930s pennant baseball glove. On the middle, you can't really see it. It's in poor condition, but it says balloon special. And it's from a player uh, named Freddie Lindstrom. He's actually a Hall of Famer from the 1930s. Played on a bunch of teams. It took me a while to identify it because it's really difficult to see there. But you can see Lindstrom right there. And uh, Freddie's middle name is Charles, I think. And that's a C right there. And I th don't think it says Freddie, but I do think that says Fred there. There was no comps. There, I could find baseball gloves from this pennant baseball glove company, but nothing just like this. The balloon special, I could find no information on. And so this was just a good example where um, the supply is low, no comps at all for, for this particular glove. The demand is high because sports memorabilia is just a really great category to sell. And there's tons of people that are excited about that category and buying in that category. And then there's an unclear market value. And so I have no idea how to price this thing. I ended up just putting it up as an auction for $29.99 with some shipping on there. And within a 24 hours, I already got two bids on it. So I don't think this one in particular is going to go very high. My guess is in the $50 range, but it's kind of fun to do an auction in that scenario because you just you just never know. When you, when you don't know the market value, you never know how valuable it could be. But this was in just such poor condition. I just don't think it's going to be very valuable. Look at that. Look how, look how beat up it is. So anyway, good question. Appreciate you asking. Coming at number two is this Ring Spotlight Cam. I bought this very recently at a garage sale over the past weekend. It sold for $109.98. I bought it for 40, so I paid up at a garage sale, but that's the thing. Sometimes you gotta spend money to make money. When I started going to garage sales, like I would scoff at anything that cost more than a few dollars. And it took me a long time to retrain my brain into reselling mode to not be afraid of spending money. Again, I spent $40, but I knew it was going to be worth it because I knew it was gonna sell for over $100, and I knew it was gonna sell very quickly because of the sell-through rate. And so look at this, it sold in two days, it sold for $109.98, and my net return was $51.35. ROI is only 128% because again, that purchase price is $40. That leaves us with number one here, this vintage Emerson electric 10 inch four blade fan. This thing is old. This is from, I don't know, 1930s, 1940s. I'm not exactly sure how old it is. I got it at that weird estate sale that was at the moving warehouse. This was something that somebody had abandoned in a moving truck. What made this one interesting though is that it came with the original box. And I think that's why mine sold as quickly as it did because look at this, 33 minutes to sell. So much so that I questioned whether I had priced it well. I went back and looked and you know, I priced it on the high end, but all the other comps were like, $60, $70. And so I priced it above that, but it sold in 33 minutes and I was shocked. And so it kind of made me worried there thinking I underpriced it, but I don't, I don't think I did. Y'all can look it up. Tell me if I did underprice it. This one came in with a net return of $56.25 and an ROI of 563% for the number one flip of the week. It's really cool. I plugged it in. It worked. I made sure not to stick my fingers in there because it would no doubt cut my fingers off. That thing was like pure metal and it was sharp. And you obviously you can see there, you can fit your fingers through those grates. I'm sure a lot of kids have lost their fingers to these types of fans over the years. But this was a fun one, 33 minutes to sell, top flip of the week, and yeah. Emerson fan right here in St. Louis, it looks like, made in St. Louis. Let's take a look at those numbers again. For the week, $1,061 in gross income and $555 in net income. 33 new listings, 29 sales. I need to ramp those listings up. I need to be at like 50, 60, 70 listings, not this 33 listings, but it requires me to find good inventory. It's been difficult to find good inventory. Garage sales cannot come soon enough. As always, thank you so much for watching. If you missed last week's episode, click here to watch it now. If you like these videos, I do them every week, so hit that subscribe button and join me next Monday. Thanks and see you soon.